People who have questions should come to the microphones, but while we are waiting for people to do that, I have one follow-up question for Lamar, for the researchers in the room. So you talked about the various surveys that you do of health departments. How accessible are these for researchers, and how do you encourage researchers to work with them? They are very accessible. I think we fill probably um, hundreds of requests uh, to, to, to look at this data and share this data. So we encourage folks to reach out to us, and we do share that. Okay. Any questions? Go to the mic. Can I just add one thing? No. I think the other thing I would add, I forget the researcher that was saying, folks believe, you know, that thought there were death panels. If the person actually was on that same side, they might believe you more than someone that's from the other side. I think, you know, the interesting thing is broadening our tent. I mean, I know Merck has doing population health, Aetna, there's other plans and folks. It may be a little trendy. And I know for my other hat, my folks may be suspicious on like, hey, really, what, are they really interested in population health or not? But these folks are in their chambers of commerce. They are going to see, fo see their representatives on both sides of the aisle. They're, and it, it can't hurt to have a different kind of voice at your chamber of commerce instead of just asking about like what's going on with education or what's going on here saying what's going on with our community and population health and so I just I would say for folks that are a little like to you know walk at the end you know to incorporate um, maybe your strange bud fellows that have not been um, your regular partners on population health because they may really be helpful in spreading this message to folks that wouldn't usually listen. Yes, Nancy Krieger, I have a quick comment and then also a, a, a genuine question to ask of all of you. The quick comment is just saying, as someone who is a public health researcher who works closely with local health departments, I have projects right now with the Boston Public Health Commission and the New York City Department of Health and Mental Hygiene. I actually think it makes for great partnerships and real partnerships whereby they know a lot of questions, I have a lot of ideas, we have time as researchers that we can actually work on things that they would like to, but also then expand capacity. And so some of this work now is, if you're you're talking about really trying to build up an understanding of societal determinants of health, how do you bring that much more into the metrics for population health so that you don't just look at, for example, percent poor, but you come up with measures at the city level that can look at questions of economic as well as racial ethnic segregation and what is that doing to health. So that's examples of kinds of things I'm doing right now. So I think it just makes for a very viable uh, model recognizing the different sets of expertise that everybody brings to the table and it's doable and I just really think it's very important as a way of keeping grounded. But there was just a conference that was at our school um, where there was someone very forcefully arguing from Australia that the language around population health wasn't working with their policymakers. And she was coming from a perspective more of urban planning and talking about making livable cities and finding that in their context that there was a way of reframing things that were about livability and sustainability that really brought attention to policymakers outside of the healthcare system as such, not that medical care is an important, critical social determinant of health, no question about that. But as I listen to you and I listen to the presentations that were earlier today, I sometimes find myself wondering if some of the language of population health works well for those of us who are in population health, because we are doing that and that's really important and that's separate from individually oriented clinical care, and it should be because we need both kinds. But I'm wondering what your thoughts are if you really want to expand out and start really taking societal determination of health seriously, what are the terms that you would see relevant and useful to have people in your worlds listen more and not have it just be driven by what are the understandable scientific concerns of people that are doing the population science research? You know, one of the things, one of the things you learn in, in the public policy process is you, you, you've, got to, you've got to talk to real people you know, as opposed to the people who you're, are your colleagues from day to day. Um, what in the world does population health mean? I, I'm not sure, I'm not sure nine out of 10 people outside this room understand what population health is. What does social determinants of health mean? You, you know, th 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 these are kind of, these are terms that we use and banty about all the time, 
But I have to say, I think it misses much of the population. And part of what we need to do as a research community is not just, and not just do the, the thoughtful underlying research, but then you have to do research about how you communicate it. Uh, and if you don't have adequate research about what it is that connects to somebody, don't expect anything other than a blank stare. Uh, and there's a science to, or at least, at least there's an art, if not a science, to communication. Uh, and all of us would do, you know, ourselves a lot of good if, in addition to the thoughtful underlying um, uh, research that's undertaken about what works, what doesn't work, what what makes sense, what doesn't make sense, then who's your audience for it? And how do you communicate to that audience? And different audiences are going to need different words, different, different language. And it is really a very important component of what all of you, all of us, need to do. Sure. I would, I would add to that that, I mean, obviously the nomenclature of lexicon is very, very important. And I think one of the um, uh, unintended consequences of, of the Affordable Care Act um, in introducing population health, which we're very, very um, happy was, was done, was there was no definitional boundaries. So what does it mean um, has, it still is, is a question. We just took a meeting, Jeff and I and some others, um, with the Secretary to talk about, you know, what does it mean and what's the role of federal government in it. The answer is it means different things to different people. So for a clinician, it might mean their patient population. For a local health commissioner, it might mean their catchment area. For a critical access hospital, it might mean, you know, the folks that they serve. Uh, so we haven't taken the time to, to define that. Um, one model that I really enjoy, and this is not a, um, a plug or anything, but I, I like the concept of a culture of health. Um, because when you begin to change cultures, I think most people understand that cultures are very um, local. Cultures are profoundly local and, and intimate. Um, and, and I like to talk a lot about um, health expectancy. What is the health expectancy of a community? Not the life expectancy, um, but the health expectancy. And so I would argue um, that in order to have um, some reasonable expectation of health in your community, um, you have to have more than access. Uh, you have to have more than literacy. You have to have more than appropriate use of your care. That's down the stream. That's down the line. That's when you're sick, when you're injured, when you need it. Yeah, let's have it there. Um, but in, in a culture of, of health, you actually have some things that kind of reinforce, enable, um, that kind of drive you and determine uh, your ability to be healthy. So those are the structures, the policies, the schools, the, uh, the houses of worship, um, the systems, um, segregation, desegregation, those types of things. So uh, from, from my perspective, I like the concept of talking about um, here are things that, that can give you a reasonable expectation of health in your culture. If you're living in this zip code, you're not going to have any expectation of health here. Why? Because these structures, policies, systems, people, players, health department, whatever, is not there. They're not invested. They're not doing what they need to do. But if you live over here, then you have it. Um, so I like, I like the term culture of health um, um, until we can get something better, at least. Pamela, do we have something better? <laughs> Better? <laughs> I'm Pamela Russo from the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation, home of the Culture for Health. Um, the, my question was related to um, Nancy's in the sense of, for those of you who have been in the federal space or, or the local state space, this, without using the term population health or you know, multiple determinants of health, do you think there's a growing understanding that actions taken in other sectors, in transportation, in housing, whatever, have an impact on health. Um, and do you some, and do you, have you had the experience where framing something that's been a politicized argument on one agenda benefits from taking a lens, take, reframing it around a health outcome? I'd say we're, we're definitely at the awareness stage is where I'd say folks are at. Um, so, um, you know, definitely in the past when we've had the highway bill, um, I know Senator Harkin tried to do a little small amendment to just say, hey, when you're building different, um, what's it called, streets, new streets and things like that, can you just maybe do a plan to think or think about should a sidewalk be there? And people are like, what are you talking about? You're going to do this on 95 or the bellway? And he's like, no, 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 no,
know. We're talking about so, but there is an awareness, you know, that this is, um, and I think folks like Jim Salas, who I know is funded by Robert Wood Johnson, did the Active Living program. You know, I, I think it's been great in working with like Tifa and others in coming up to the hill and discussing it. Again, I think we're at awareness. You do have a lot of competing, I mean, the asphalt lobby, right? They are not, you know, they, is this money going to take away from building roads? And that's a question, right? And, um, you know, so you have a lot of variables there. Um, I think what's very hard when you talk about population health that I found in the Senate is that things are in such Sorry. different silos, right? Even though my boss was you know, not just on the health side, he was on the education side, so he would try to input population health into Head Start or into the educ. That's a whole different staff, even though, you know, I mean, he was the same boss on that, but then transportation's a whole different staff and all of these different programs, um, agriculture, of course. With, um, so it helps to have the scientific community coming together and showing that picture. But then I think the other hurdle is making sure you have the right staff in front of you that can influence those different um, sectors. Brent, the last question. Great. Brent Dewig, um, Director of Policy of the Association of Maternal and Child Health Programs, and, and commenting on that difficulty in engaging on population health and getting Hill staffers and, and members to understand it. What we found is using concrete examples. And so what we frame is, is not to undermine health insurance coverage, but to say we have less uninsured kids than ever before in history because of Medicaid and CHIP. Fundamental, foundational, you know, necessary, we support that, but hasn't made much of a dent in the childhood obesity epidemic. Similarly, injury, leading cause of death for kids, and injury and hospitalization. So we need those coverage programs, treat them when they get injured, but we're not investing enough upstream. And that opens that door to talk about, okay, so what strategies do get out of the, the health coverage of the clinical setting? The, the challenge, and here's where the plea for help is, and, and this is based on a real-life story. We're up lobbying the, the woman who writes the Labor HHS appropriations bill this year, and we went in with a very modest request, $2 million increase to our $635 million program, just get us back to where we were pre-sequestration. And, and we do that not because we don't think we need more, but because of these caps, you have to kind of come in with a credible request. So she goes through and she listens to my pitch, and she says, now, what would $2 million get you? And I said, well, you know, for each state that has picked these evidence-based strategies with accountable performance measures, they'd be able to extend those interventions. And she kind of looked at me and nodded, and I looked at her and nodded, and I said, not nearly as satisfying as an answer as you'll get from my friends at the community health centers that would say $2 million will get you, you know, this number of clinics, perhaps in your district, and they'll serve, you know, on average 7,000 people with three comprehensive primary care, I and mean, they can detail out that cost unit. So that's the request is more economic analysis of here's not only is this a, an effective intervention that's proven to work, but here's about what it would cost. And, and we just need estimates. We don't need exact. And, and I know that's difficult because a big rural state is going to be different from an urban setting. But being able to say these population health strategies need this much money. And TIFA, of course, has been a leader in helping us um, both commissioning that research and helping us. But this board, I think, can really help move that forward, too. We need that because without it, we're competing against a much more politically appealing message of this many more constituents will get served versus this population that may or may not be voting for me will be served. So any reactions and other examples of concrete, concrete examples that, that get through will be helpful. Okay, so I was gonna offer, we talk a lot about silos. Uh, I would offer um, that our focus sometimes should look at cycles. Um, and that is the political cycle. Um, because what happens oftentimes is that you get some buy-in with that elected official. Um, but the thing about upstream a uh, activity strategies um, and approaches is it takes time. And they can't wait that, you know, that four or five years down the line where they can get some return on that investment and some credit for it as well. So, you know, we, we have to um, get better at telling stories to some of our elected officials and addressing the cycles of it. Um, and that's where kind of changing the culture, if you can begin to change the culture so folks that live in that culture prioritize value and can be real live adv advocates for uh, some of these sustained changes, then you may, may get some traction. I just want to add one perspective that's tangential to your, your question. Um, I, I think it's really important, particularly as, as we're thinking now more about social determinants of health and, and especially 
what non-medical services, uh, what social services actually play a significant role. And one of the things that we all have to do is not just simply uh, analyze how effective it is, we also have to analyze how cost effective it is. Uh, and you know that's not something that's a favored part of government research. In fact, because of death panels, um, you know, PCORI is, is not allowed to do research with respect to cost effectiveness. Um, one of the things we're doing in partnership with a group called ICER, the Institute for Clinical and Economic Review, we're going to be taking about half a dozen clinical problems <clears throat> and try to analyze not just the clinical effective choices that people have, but the cost effective choices people have. Uh, and to the extent that uh, we want to encourage interventions which are not medicalized but have a real impact on healthcare, we've clearly got to do that. So a child who's got asthma, you know, how cost effective might it be to do mold removal in a house? you know, that might avoid an asthma attack. You, you can do this for a variety of different chronic health conditions. And I would say we, as a research community, have got to make sure that we're not simply answering the question what is effective or clinically effective, but to the extent that you want that research ultimately to move a public agenda on policy, you're going to have to describe its cost effectiveness because everyone is really cost conscious, even if they are preventing us from undertaking the research about cost effectiveness. Ultimately, when you try to sell something on Capitol Hill, if you're not talking about how you're gonna pay for it or how it pays for itself, you're in trouble. So it's really critical as part of our research tasks. And Linda will get the last word. Very, just a, <laughs> no, um, a, a quick addendum uh, as a specific issue. So in managed care plans, for example, the value added type of services and how those are incorporated into capitation rates. How can you reward those entities that are looking at, you know, broader than just clinical care um, because they get it. Um, but you don't want to tie their hands behind their backs by not adequately reimbursing them for their creative creativity and innovation. So coming up with ways that we can, you know, tackle those sorts of things, that's, that's a very important um, area for, um, you know, teasing out uh, those pieces. So we've had some really good input for us to now sit at our tables and do whatever this exercise is that we are doing that is going to come up with a research agenda. Join me in thanking this panel for giving us some good ideas to start that discussion.